all lead us to the idea that we are more aware of the idea of external reality being some form of simulation that we've ever done before. Now, when Aldous Huxley wrote his book back in 1954, it was an excellent book, but he was writing from experience and he couldn't necessarily link that to known science. Whereas now we are in this very, very strong position of understanding exactly the relationship between consciousness and reality and how that relationship can be widened by certain substances or certain neurological or neurochemical states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously we've learned quite a bit since then. And I mentioned uh, Gnostics in the intro, and you talk about the Pleroma quite often in the book. For people who are unfamiliar, tell us about how the Gnostics viewed reality and this Pleroma they described and how that fits into your view. Okay. The Gnostics were a group of individuals, group of, a religious group, around about the 1st and 2nd century AD. And they've always been around, and they were probably around before that period. But effectively, they were a group of theologians and individuals who thought very, very deeply about the true nature of reality. And one of the major issues they had with the belief systems of the time was something called theodicy. And theodicy is why it is that a good God, Yewa, whatever we want to call him, is willing to accept the existence of evil. The logic being that how could a truly eminently good God create childhood cancer or how could he allow evil to exist and indeed why would he allow the existence of lucifer or whatever we want to talk about now at that time obviously most people had a religious worldview and a mystic worldview of how reality worked and the the gnostics concluded quite rationally and i'm sure this is a position that most thinking individuals come to at some stage in their life is that maybe the God that is the God of the Old Testament or even the God of the New Testament isn't necessarily the real God, that there is an existence behind this existence and that this existence has been created by what is known as the Demiurge, the half creator, Yaldabaoth. And the idea that we are trapped within this a simulated world that keeps us away from the real reality behind the reality. Now, the Gnostics called that reality, the reality behind reality, or the God above God, as my friend Miguel Connor calls it, that is the Pleroma. And the Pleroma is from the Latin. I think it's from Latin. It may even be from Greek. And it literally means fullness. And it's the idea that there is something behind this reality that we can, under certain circumstances, perceive, or part of us can perceive. Because the Gnostics argued that what has happened is we have all within us a shard of the pleroma, a little kind of nugget within ourselves that is that is, is lost from the pleroma, that is that is beyond our understanding. And this yearns and knows that there's something greater. And Gnosticism, and of course the word gnosis means knowledge, is that by gnosis we can enlighten literally and metaphorically, that shard of the pleroma that's inside ourselves to realize that we are far greater than this illusory reality we live within. Of course, the issue is that the Gnostics also argue that there are elements of the demiurge, Yaldaboth, that are, are agents within the world, which, which they term the archons. Now, anybody who knows the movie The Matrix well, no, this is the central concept of the Matrix. And in fact, the Matrix and the Wachowski brothers readily acknowledged that they would they were talking about Gnosticism here. And of course, the idea that Neo becomes an enlightened being, he becomes aware when when he takes the, the red pill, he becomes aware of the fact that there is a reality behind the reality. And the Agent Smith and his associates are there to actually deny us that overall existence. Now, the issue here is always that spirituality and mysticism, as opposed to religion, which is dogma, mysticism and spirituality teach greater truths using analogies. 
because effectively if you are an entity or something you're trying to explain very deep esoteric ideas to the masses the only way you can do that is by analogy so effectively i would argue that the whole gnostic worldview is an analogy of a knowledge that has been known for centuries and has been carried through the gnostic traditions of christian gnosticism the kabbalah of judaism and sufism of the muslims and on top of this 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 idea that reality is an illusion is also found in all eastern religions you know the concept of maya in hinduism it is all the idea that this is some form of brain generated illusion mm -hmm. and of course we now know from our knowledge of how the brain works and our knowledge of neurology and our knowledge of what is now called consciousness studies the idea of how the brain recreates within itself an inner image of what external reality is and we might be able to touch upon that later but effectively gnosticism has great truths within it and it has been abused and has been warped over the centuries but the message is still correct that we are trapped in meat machines and we are existing within meat machines that we presume are ourselves but a very quick thinking of grammar here makes you realize that the illusion is not as strong as we are led to believe because you turn around and you say my leg my arm my face my brain my ears you never ever say me in reference to these things these are things that are outside of yourself that you perceive now there's a guy called Harding many years ago who wrote an amazing book on I think it was titled something like on realizing he didn't have a head and he was sitting on a mountain top Douglas Harding and he was sitting on a mountain top and he he looked at his body and for a second he had one of those amazing moments of clarity where he realized that he was a headless body as far as his own perceptions were concerned there was this body underneath him but he couldn't see his own head <laughs> and from then he realized that his head is attuning to a much wider reality than the reality that we normally see your brain your consciousness interfaces with two realities it interfaces with the external reality the phenomenal world that's that's presented to your consciousness but then there is the other reality the inner reality the inner reality of emotions the inner reality of dreams of out of the body experiences and this is what i try to approach in my writing and this is the the major theme of my latest book opening the doors of perception mhm mm well said man and yeah that gnostic worldview is probably my favorite perspective of the ones that are offered up and on the subject of those consciousness studies you mentioned there are a lot of people in this alternative realm that talk about the examination of out of body or near death experiences they study psychedelics and entheogen use but i don't see a lot of people trying to tie in conditions like migraines epilepsy and schizophrenia just to name a couple that's a big part of your latest book probably one of my favorite parts how is this component helped in you understanding the big picture totally i mean one of the the issues that i've had for a long long time is silo thinking and the way in which out there there are experts and and it's the, by the very nature of academic study that what you do is you study in smaller and smaller areas of knowledge so therefore you become the world's leading expert on i don't know the the knee function of the lesser spotted uh, antelope or something yeah yeah and effectively you become the world's expert in that but what you don't do is because you've specialized to such an extent you don't have the cross fertilization of ideas from other world views and other areas of research now you can expand that out to say that you could end up studying psychology but effectively studying psychology you also need an understanding of neurology and of neurochemistry and what is happening is that there are very few people out there that are joining the dots not because they're not deliberately doing so you know i'm not one of these people that believe that science is somehow in denial of of altered states of consciousness it's just that scientists run down a certain path and they effectively from i know from when i was at university in the 1970s there was the overlay because i'm a social scientist and I'm a sociologist and th there were areas of what's called positivism and the idea that the the only thing that really exists is physical reality and the only thing that is 
is the physical material world. Whereas there are other people who argue the material world is just but one aspect of a far broader worldview. But as long as you are denied academic tenure by pursuing areas of ideas that consciousness itself should be studied in greater detail, the very fact that you start to be interested in the further reaches of consciousness tends to cause you problems in academia. And I know this because there are an associates and friends of mine who are academics and work in academia. And whenever I meet them for a drink or whenever we talk on Skype and everything else, they will always turn around to me and say about extraordinary experiences they've had. They've had out of the body experiences. They've had near death experiences. They have perceived aliens. They've seen UFOs. But all these individuals will always say, I can never, ever discuss these things with my fellow academics purely and simply because if I do so, that will compromise my credibility. And the issue is that they're all thinking this, that all of them are stuck in this materialist paradigm whereby you have to deny the inner life. There is a form of uh, psychology at the moment known as eliminative materialism. And eliminative materialism is the mainstay of most psychology and most, new, most neurology. And effectively, that is, we do not have an inner life. We do not. We are fooling ourselves into thinking we are self-referential conscious beings. Now, believe it or not, that is the status quo and that is the approach that most research scientists in neurology and social sciences and the science of consciousness studies take. Mm. We are fooling ourselves into thinking we are even conscious. Now, just a moment's reflection shows how incredibly stupid that is, because if I am being fooled into thinking I am conscious by my brain, I have to be aware to be fooled. In other words, I can't fool a rock into thinking it's an elephant because a rock is not conscious. In other words, you have to be conscious to be fooled. And they don't seem to join those dots. The, the Daniel Dennett's of this world, the, the Patricia Churchons of this world are in complete and utter denial. And every single sentient consciousness on this planet, the three billion sentient consciousnesses on this planet, know that that's utter crap. Yeah. But we still believe in it. And it's because it's scientism. It is not science. It is a referred belief that we all have to nod like nodding dogs to agree that this is correct. We need to break out of that. And what I'm trying to do is in my work, I discuss everything from neurochemistry to neurology, to Gnosticism, to quantum physics, to the latest research in terms of consciousness studies. And I really genuinely do do my research. If you go out on the web, you'll find that there are people who will criticize me. There's a, there's a site called Rational Wiki, I think right. it is. And if you do a search on Anthony Peake, it'll be the second or third one that will come up. You read that article on me. It's an ad hominem attack. There is nowhere in that article it criticizes even vaguely my understanding of quantum physics, my understanding of neurology, my understanding of neurochemistry. The reason it doesn't is that my understanding of these subjects are pretty damn watertight. Hmm. So in other words, if you read my books, you will find that every single reference I make, and I mean every single reference will have a reference number and that will refer you at the back to an academic article or an article written in a scientific magazine and it will give you the opportunity to read back to the peer-reviewed analysis that's being done i believe i'm probably the only writer in this field that is doing that and i scur them shitless <laughs> because i scur the hell out of them because there, it's so easy to dismiss these weirdos who say that they're channeling information from the planet Tharg, you know, that they're ascended beings, that they're, you know, star seeds and all <laughs> that nonsense. Oh, I know. They're very easy to, to, to attack. And they love attacking them because they're easy to attack. I'm not. Mm -hmm. And because I'm not, I have been invited on two or three occasions to address groups of skeptics. On every occasion, they back down. They back down, they run away and they run away because they don't have any answers to the things I'm saying, because I am a skeptic. I'm a skeptic by background. I used to be a reader of the Skeptical Inquirer. I read all the skeptical books. 
I know all the arguments the skeptics use, so I can throw their arguments back at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, your your work is definitely well sourced and pretty ironclad. The gatekeepers of monoculture, they're going to do what they're going to do, but it seems like you're definitely passing them up. And something I've been interested in lately is the similarities between modern encounters with the greys and old stories of fairy folk and little people. And I was really psyched to see that your book brings this up when you talk about this Charles Bonney syndrome, which was completely new to me. Maybe you can talk to us about that a bit and unfortunately your mother's experiences with it. No, absolutely. I, I, I have been heavily into ufology since 1966 which is a million years ago and way before a lot of the listeners out there were even born. And I have been studying ufology for, for that whole period. And it has always intrigued me as to the, the cultural aspects. And when I was at university, I studied sociology. I studied the sociology of religion, the sociology of belief. So I am qualified in raised commas to discuss these things because, you know, I've written extensively in academic stuff about this kind of material. Mm -hmm. And it is it is interesting to note that the idea of other entities and little creatures and little beings is in every culture right across the world. And it has been recorded since recorded writing, you know, so effectively it goes back an awful long way now. I came across a book called Project Trojan Horse by John Keel that was written, I think, about 1969, 1970, and then followed on by the fantastic research of a French ufologist called Jacques Vallée, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called Passport to Magonia. Now, if you read particularly Vallée and also a guy called Brinsey Le Portranche, who's a very little known Lord Clancarty, who was an Anglo-Irish lord, who wrote a book called The Sky People way back in about 1963, which was an amazing book. But effectively, what these guys are arguing and what Valley is arguing is that the UFO phenomenon is closely tied to our own psyche. We're dealing here with archetypes. We are dealing here with Jungian archetypes. In fact, Carl Gustav Jung wrote a book about UFOs and about the archetypal nature of UFOs and UFO entities. Now, I'd followed this through for many years. And funnily enough, uh, breaking news, you may be interested to know that the new book, Opening the Doors of Perception, my publisher, Watkins, are so stunned by this book, they've already paid me in advance to write the sequel. Boom. You know, and that to me and my writing career is unknown. You know, the book has only just come out. And before the book came out, they'd already said, we want you to write a sequel on this book. And the sequel will be Through the Doors of Perception. Mm. So it will be dealing with these issues. But going back to the idea that they are archetypes in some way, the story gets very, very strange because it involves my own mother. And around about four or five years ago, uh, now the background story is my mother lost her eye with malignant melanoma in her mid 50s. And she started developing glaucoma in her good eye. So effectively, she's partially sighted. And she's a widow, lives on her own, or did used to live on her own, in a house in a little place called Bromberpool Village, which is on the Wirral Peninsula near Liverpool. And she was travelling home to the village, walking onto the village with my aunt, my father's mother, my father's son, my father's sister. And my aunt stopped to tie her shoelace. And my mother, this incident, my mother phoned me up this evening because she was so disturbed by it. She, as my auntie stopped, my mother looked over my auntie's head and saw in the sky what she described as being a cloud of smoke circling around itself. And I just noticed smoke, a little smoke, which is a <laughs> higher side chats thing. As I said, smoke, nice little bit of synchronicity there, I think. Yeah. And as the, she said, it started to swirl around itself and turn into a disc shape and then suddenly shot off at high speed towards North Wales. So effectively to her left hand side as she was looking at it, she phones me up and she says, I'm not sure what I saw there. Now, my mother doesn't know anything about UFOs. She has never been shown any interest in my UFO books or anything. So I genuinely know this is just not something in her worldview at all. She describes this. And I said, Mum, you probably it was just your eyesight. You probably saw something peculiar. 
I leave it at that. And about two or three days later, she phones me up one morning and she's in absolute hysterics. She lives on her own. My aunt had gone back and she woke up in the middle of the she described that she woke up in the middle of the night and she swore blind that she had closed her bedroom door. She woke up and she was in a state of sleep paralysis, you know, REM intrusion, whereby, you know, you're asleep, but you're awake at the same time. And because your body, when you are in these states, paralyzes yourself to actually stop yourself damaging yourself. It's a phenomenon known as REM intrusion. When the dreams overlay the reality that you're perceiving outside. And she said she was looking towards the door of the bedroom and the door was partially open. And she thought to herself, why is the door open? And as she did that, she noticed two or three spindly fingers come round the door. And then this tiny head poke its head round. And she described the head as being the creature must have been about three foot tall. She said it had a completely bald head. It had huge black eyes. It had two holes for nostrils and a slit for a mouth. Mm. It looked at her and realized she was looking at it and dodged its head back. My mother then spent the rest of the night terrified before she eventually, I guess, went into full REM sleep. She phones me up the next day and I'm listening to this and I'm going, my God, yeah. this is intriguing. Because as you know, the foreword for my new book is written by Whitley Strieber. And as you know, Whitley Strieber was the guy that put the greys on the map with his book Communion. Right. Because if you look at the cover of the book Communion, it's the classic grey. Now, my mother, the only the only science fiction film I think my mother has ever watched was E.T. Now, you look at E.T., E.T. is not a grey in any shape or form. That's the only linkage I think she could make. But she wouldn't have made she she was in her mid 80s then there's no way she would make any kind of association with the object she had seen three or four days before with this other being that was in her room anyway i, I call around to see her regularly but it was a few weeks later after i'd calmed her down over this hmm. thing and we're talking and she goes i wish the, the children would stop singing they really bother me and i said which children are these mum and she said oh the children that follow me round when i'm shopping wow and i said what well, what happens and she said there are little little creatures they're like little children and they sing in this really kind of weird way they've got these really high pitched sound voices and i said mum wh where do you see them she said i see them when i'm shopping and i see them in the house they're in the house and I said, what, these creatures that are in your living room? And she said, oh, yes, yes. They're not threatening. They're very, very friendly. And they chatter to each other. And they, they giggle a lot. And then she said, and they're like the man I see in the kitchen. And I said, what man's this, mum? She said, oh, there's a tall elderly man I see in the kitchen. He never speaks, but he nods at me and he smiles a lot. So he's a nice man. And I'm thinking, does she let people into the house? <laughs> does she let local children into the house? Clearly she wasn't. Bells started to ring in my head. And because I've been involved in this kind of work for many, many years, I started thinking there is something here happening. And I thought it's Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now, Charles Bonnet syndrome was discovered, curiously enough, by a guy called Charles Bonnet. It's fascinating, isn't it, how these people have discover things that subsequently you discover are the same name as them. You know, it's uh, like Einstein's theory of relativity. How did Einstein discover Einstein's theory of relativity? <laughs> I'm being facetious. Right. But Charles Bonnet was a, a French doctor in, I think, around about the 1780s, 1790s. I can stand corrected on that because I'm not sure, but it was about that period. And his father or his grandfather started to claim that he was hallucinating little creatures and little people. And Bonnet started to look into this and discovered that it was part and parcel of growing older. And the older somebody got, and if they were likely, if they were partially sighted or losing their sight, they started to see little creatures everywhere. Now, I then thought, well, this sounds like what's happening to my mother. So I started to read up on the subject and to my little surprise, because I was expecting this, I discovered that Charles Bonnet syndrome is a prodrome. It is a, a precursor for Alzheimer's. 
And my mother's behavior was getting more and more erratic and her memory was going and everything else. So I came to the conclusion that she was developing Alzheimer's. But of course, I'm a lay person hmm. and, you know, I needed to get assurance on this. So I took her to her doctor and her doctor had never heard of Charles Bonnet syndrome. <laughs> Why should they know? Why should they know? And to be a reasonable, why should they know? <laughs> but with an aging population, you would think that more and more doctors should be aware of this psychological state because it is a way of early diagnosing Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Because we subsequently discovered she did have low cell uh, Alzheimer's. And she was diagnosed with the Alzheimer's and it became progressively worse. And she's now literally catatonic. Now, the curious thing about this is that my research into Charles Bonnet syndrome, and there's a whole chapter on Charles Bonnet syndrome in the new book, is that Charles Bonnet syndrome is also experienced by young children. And it is also known as the mythical friends. You know, the way children, there's a monster under the bed, or they see fairies, or they see entities. This is the same thing. So young children have it, and elderly people have it. Now, what is this telling us about the way in which we develop as we get older? And I then started to read up and I found that Charles Bonnet syndrome is also experienced by individuals who suffer from classic migraine. Now, I'm a classic migrainer. I've never, ever seen little entities, but I have the, the, the aura state and I have everything which we can touch upon later. But I discovered that there are writers and individuals who into their 20s and 30s seem to carry forward the seeing of mythical friends or imaginary friends into the post-pubescent period. Because, of course, most children lose this, usually at eight or nine. But definitely by the time they get into pubescence, they stop. And I think I know the reason why this happens, which we'll touch upon later. And it's to do in passing with the, the corpus callosum in the brain, which is the thick body of fiber that holds the left and right hemispheres together. The neurons in that area up into the ages of six or seven don't have myelination. And myelination is, is actually insulation of the neurons in the brain which effectively means that the right and left hemispheres of the brains of children do not communicate, hmm. which effectively means they are bicameral, which means that they either exist in their dominant or non-dominant hemispheres, which opens up, I argue, for the doors of perception, which we'll touch upon later. But with people with classic migraine, you find that they see, many of them do, they see little children. And there's a, an American writer called Siri Husfeld, and she still experiences Charles Bonnet syndrome, and she's now in her 40s. And she describes in her books what she sees. And one incident she describes is, is uncanny. She was sitting on her bed, and suddenly through the door of her bedroom was a little farmer, about eight inches tall, with a little cow. And he's pulling the cow. And the cow is responding and pulling back at him. So he gets a stick out and he beats the cow. And as he does so, a little police car comes round full of little police officers who get out and arrest him, push him into the police car and drive out. And she's sitting there watching this. And this hallucination for Rin Ray's commas is out there in three dimensional reality. Hmm. Now, this phenomenon is known. And before people think I'm making this up. I strongly advise you read the book Hallucinations by Oliver Sacks, the late Oliver Sacks. And Oliver Sacks is one of the most fascinating writers on extraordinary psychological, neurological experiences that people have. He wrote a famous book called The Mike, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Hmm. Wonderful, wonderful title. And it literally was one of his patients was suffering from ag agnesia and, and various other problems. And he literally thought his wife was his hat. So he tried to pick her up and put her on his head. OK, <laughs> and he has a whole chapter in his book, Hallucinations, on Charles Bonnet syndrome. And in this chapter, he discusses in great detail the things I have discussed in greater detail in my book about elderly people 
and the way Charles Bonnet syndrome seems to start developing. Now, I believe this is because old age and youth, it being an infant, are directly related. And that as an old person, have you ever noticed with old people, as they get older, they become more childlike. Mm -hmm. They start to look more like a child. My mother, I've watched my mother go in reverse from being a woman in her 70s, being very fit and active and very, very bright to becoming more like a child and even more like a child till now. She's virtually a fetus. <laughs> she's curled up in bed. She's tiny. She's in a fetal position. She doesn't move. She doesn't communicate just like a baby does. Mm. And I believe this is because when you die, you go back to being reborn again. And everything psychologically, you are developing and going back down into childhood, into infancy. And then you get reborn again in the start. And of course, in my books, I've discussed this in in great detail. But what in the first book, this is the first book I've done where I've actually pulled together powerful, powerful information. There was a guy called Barry Reisberg in 1984. Again, he's a scientist. He's a neurologist. He came up with the hypothesis called retrogenesis. And retrogenesis is exactly what I have just said. It's where the old person becomes a child. They go backwards in time. Hmm. But of course, he wouldn't argue they start again. But I argue they do. I argue that our life is a circle. Our life is like, well, it's like a spiral. And when we die, we go back and we're reborn again. Yeah. And there's more and more evidence. This is powerful evidence from neurology that this is the case, because, of course, what happens is when the child starts to become aware of its world, what does it do? It, it sees the world as an extension of itself. We know this, how children's minds work, you know, from Piaget and the developmental people, Vygotsky and other people that looked at the development of young children all through the centuries, uh, all through recent years. We know this is how the child develops. And I believe they carry through their doors of perception as Aldous Huxley described them. Well, in fact, it wasn't Aldous Huxley. It was William Blake from the from the poem from uh, Songs of Innocence, I think it was. But effectively, the doors of perception are open. And this is the whole theme of the book. So from my mother's experiences. But I think the important detail here is the alien encounter. The way in which the aliens seem to be the facilitator and seem to be something that was the start of the opening the doors of perception. And I think this is of profound significance, especially when we start discussing, which hopefully we will later, DMT experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Man, those are powerful observations and a really elegant way to describe old age and the dying process makes it seem a lot less scary. I really do like that. And. You know, you mentioned hallucinations and your book talks about that a lot, but it is such a loaded term. And to be clear, this isn't to say that these things people are experiencing or seeing aren't real autonomous or conscious entities, only that they can't be sensed in brains of neurotypical states, which is a term that I like that I got from you. But I guess it gets really weird when UFOs leave physical traces or people are found with implants. I mean, yeah. how do we rectify some of those physical traces of what, you know, the monoculture would want to say are just hallucinations? Well, this is where the problem lies, because my mother's experience of seeing the, the UFO over Price's factory on the Wirral was subsequently vindicated by a Facebook friend of mine called Morrigan Hawkins. And again, if you want to link up with me, anybody out there wants to link up with me on space on, on Facebook, <laughs> there's a Freudian slip. Um, <laughs> effectively, do so because I'm very, very active on there, and I have you know thousands and thousands of people involved in my work across the world who contact me. But Morrigan is somebody who lives on the world, and she contacted me because we have a mutual friend, a friend of mine, Richard Fleming, and she is a friend of his. And she said, "I saw you put up on Facebook your mother's experience," and she said. I'm 95% certain I saw that object at that time. And she was crossing something called the White Bridge, which is on the A41 highway on the Wirral. And she was looking towards the very same factory that my mother saw her experience. And she saw exactly the same object. 
and it flew in exactly the same direction. And Morrigan described to me that she was in a taxi with a friend of hers and the taxi driver, and they all saw it. So here we have some kind of external reality that is impinging upon internal reality. But if we conclude that both internal hallucinations and external reality are both elements of the same thing, suddenly the idea that physical manifestations in three-dimensional reality somehow discredit or credit the hallucinations suddenly becomes a moot point. In other words, the reason that we perceive external reality the way we do is because the brain itself internally generates a model of external reality within the brain and presents it to consciousness, which means that external reality is as much a brain generated hallucination as internal reality is. Now, this again is not mad nonsense. Anybody who actually understands how the brain internally models reality knows this is a fact. I was in a debate with skeptics, a formal debate in London two years ago. There were three on my team and three skeptics and we wiped the earth with them. That's why they never involve me in these kind of debates. And one of the guys on, on my side was a guy called Professor Raymond Tallis. And Raymond Tallis is an absolute polymath, brilliant, brilliant mind, brilliant guy. And Ray, in his presentation, now, again, if anybody's interested, Ray's presentation is on YouTube. If you just look up Raymond Tallis, London debate, you will find it. OK. And in his opening presentation, he makes this amazing comment where he says that. The idea that out-of-body experiences and NDEs and other extraordinary experiences are extraordinary and strange is weird because it's just as extraordinary and strange that I'm having a real life experience. Right. It is just as odd. But people never, ever think about that, that I am something somewhere, somehow behind my eyes and between my ears that somehow aware of all this that's around me in a ordinarily dead universe. I am something perceiving something. And this is why people never, ever think deeply enough. You know, they dismiss NDEs and they dismiss OBEs, but they never, ever think. But isn't it absolutely staggeringly amazing that I'm here? And indeed, is it not staggeringly amazing that anything exists rather than nothing? Mm -hmm. But it does. And it is perceived by me. Now, again, as a, an analogy I've used in my previous writings here, when people turn around and say external reality is real, internal and hallucinations are not. The only reason that an hallucination is an hallucination is because it is not shared by anybody else. That is the absolute definition. It is a perception that is external to yourself that nobody else perceives. But there is something else in psychology called a folie a deux. And a folie a deux is when you and another person share an hallucination, which has been recorded many, many times. So here we have a problem for materialist reductionist science, because the only way they can explain a folie a deux, which is a shared hallucination, is by falling back on telepathy, mm -hmm. communication between brains at a distance. But they don't believe in that anyway. So they use one thing they don't believe in to explain something else they don't believe in. <laughs> when you then have a group of individuals who collectively have an hallucination, like many of the mass UFO sightings with the incident at, uh, at Fatima, where the, the sun supposedly spun in the sky, mm -hmm. these things were so, so seen by thousands of people. That's collective hysteria. So we have thousands of people sharing an hallucination. <laughs> but if thousands of people can share an hallucination, why is external reality similarly not an hallucination? Because the only reason I believe that external reality is real is because other people correspond and agree with me, it is consensually real. It's actually a term called consensual reality. We consent to the fact that we see the same things. 
Mm -hmm. But clearly, collective hallucinations destroy that argument. Right. So there are researchers in recent years. There's a couple of guys many, many years ago came up with a book on hallucinations. There's a lady called Celia Green and her associate, I think it's Christopher or Colin McCreary. And they came up with something called a metachoric model of perception. And the metachoric model is simply this. Everything is an hallucination. Hmm. Everything. And to me, that makes eminent good sense. Absolutely. I agree. And maybe we should throw dimethyltryptamine in here a little bit because you could consider it a bit of a clue that I have. I mean, I've heard other researchers suggest that because the alien abduction phenomenon and UFO sightings seem to repeat with people, they seem to be multi-generational. I've heard some people equate that to the reasoning being that maybe it's because of a hereditary DMT dumping condition of some kind or yeah. some kind of chemical issue. What are your thoughts on that? And maybe, you know, also what role does dimethyltryptamine play in the big picture? Okay, well, the things we have to discuss here is that there will be people out there who will be believing that some people know that DMT, just an explanation, dimethyltryptamine is the most powerful hallucinogenic substance probably known to man. Mm -hmm the most powerful one thus discovered. It's in nature. It's, it's in plants. It seems to be everywhere. It seems to be unusual to find places where it's not. It's been found in the, the cerebral fluid, the, in the back, in the, in the spinal cord. It's been found in the liver, and I think it's been found in the lining of the stomach. But educated people will counter the argument and say, yes, that is it may be, but it's never been discovered in the brain. It has been discovered in the brain. It's just that people don't know about it. Mm. And the reason being is that I think this discovery has caused incredible problems with the deniers of the greater reality. 2014, I think it was, there was a paper published by a lady called Jimo Bojijin, who was at the University of Michigan. And she's been researching the brains of rats. And she did some tests on rats that year. And she found inside the pineal gland of rats dimethyltryptamine. The rat's brain is a mammalian brain. It has evolved in exactly the same way as the human brain has evolved. The reason that they do experiments with rats is because the neu neurological, the way the brain communicates with a rat is incredibly similar mm -hmm. to the way the human brain comes about. They found it in a live rat. Now, if that is the case, either dimethyltryptamine is generated by the pineal gland or it is. It appears from somewhere else in the body, in the pineal gland. But there is no question that it was inside the pineal gland. Now, this then explains why it's in the, the, the spinocerebral fluid. It explains why it's in the body. It explains why it's in the blood. It's part of us. We have evolved in this way. Now, the reason we don't know that dimethyltryptamine is in the pineal gland of live people is obvious. It doesn't, doesn't last very long and it, it, it changes into other substances. So unless anybody is willing to volunteer to have their brain split open and have a sensor put inside their pineal gland, we'll never know. But if somebody volunteers to do that, I guarantee they will discover that DMT is generated by the pineal gland. There is lots of supporting evidence for this. For example, there are things called the TARS receptors, the trace amine associated receptors. And there's something called the sigma one and sigma two receptor sites. And these receptor sites within the neurons of the brain are known to react with dimethyltryptamine. It's as if they are designed, they're like little harbors and receptor sites are always designed to work with particular neurotransmitters, which are chemicals that are generated by the brain to communicate, send messages across the brain. These are designed to work with dimethyltryptamine. Mm. 
Now, if dimethyltryptamine, these have been designed, this means that dimethyltryptamine is something called a neurotransmitter. Right. And if it is a neurotransmitter, it is our modulator of reality. And this is something that Rick Stressman argued. So suddenly we have something very curious here because dimethyltryptamine has been known for many, many years. And I'll touch upon ayahuasca later if we get the opportunity. But just to focus into dimethyltryptamine for a second, in the early 1990s, a guy called Professor Rick Strassman was employed by the American government. This is known. This is not, not conspiracy theory. This is a known fact. Was employed together with his university, the University of New Mexico, to do research into the effects of dimethyltryptamine on volunteers. And they had scores of volunteers who volunteered to take intravenously, have injected into their bloodstream dimethyltryptamine. And then their job was to then have the dimethyltryptamine experience and report back to the scientists what they experienced. Now, the curious thing here, and again, if anybody is interested, I'm sure there's a lot of individuals out there who've already read the book. It's called Spirit Molecule. Mm -hmm. But Rick reports as he would do in a scientific way, the reports that the individuals gave, all of them said that when they were in the DMT state, they realized that this here is the hallucination. The DMT trip opened up their doors of reception to the pleroma, for want of a better term. I mean, Rick doesn't use that term, but I do. And suddenly they're in another reality. There is another level of reality above ours. And in this level of reality, there are entities. And these entities have motivations. These entities show planning. These entities communicate. They're not like things that appear in normal dreams. They are things that were expecting them. Some of them, when they went, they got into this place where they, they go into this kind of cloudscape. And there are these beings that they can see through the clouds. And then the beings start to look at them. The beings were expecting them. The beings knew that they were taking DMT and were ready for them. Mm -hmm. The beings in question were generally described in a very similar way to greys. Not only that, but Terence McKenna, who is one of the major writers on DMT, called them the machine elves. Right. And these entities are virtually identical to the entities that my mother saw. They are identical to the, the, the lots of entities that people see in out-of-the-body experiences, people who in remote viewing, and people who are abducted with UFOs. Now, the weird and rather disturbing thing about this, and it will be the feature of my new book, is what are they up to? Because they seem to be experimenting. Because, again, these individuals during the DMT trips recorded really awful things being done to them. Now, what is significant here is that there can be parallels drawn here to shamanic traveling, because when people shamanic travel, they meet entities when they shamanically travel. And there is something called a shamanic journey. And in the shamanic journey, somebody, the person, the shaman is dismembered and cut into by other beings. It's part and parcel of the process of becoming a shaman. Now, in the book, I describe a series of incidents that took place in the life of a guy called Myron Dial, who is a Californian artist. And Myron, ever since his early childhood, has been traveling to a place he calls Zelcon. And in Zelcon, there are entities. And there's one sequence which I discuss in the book taken from his non-published autobiography called The Boy That Nobody Wanted, which I strongly suggest you should read. He describes how he is ripped apart by entities and then put together again and regenerated. Now, the intriguing thing about Myron is he has temporal lobe epilepsy, which in my book I say is the next level where the doors of perception are opened slightly wider from migraine to epilepsy, and particularly temporal lobe epilepsy. So suddenly, I'm starting to pull together something that actually is very, very, very structured. It's suddenly I'm not writing that 
I've had these weird experiences and in those weird experiences, the Martians have told me all these things. I'm actually doing the science and saying there are direct links between migraine and temporal lobe epilepsy. In fact, there is a known syndrome. There is something called a leptoid, a leptoid migraine, where individuals, you cannot tell the difference between a migraine aura and a temporal lobe epilepsy aura. So these are people who the door looking into the pleroma is starting to get wider and wider. Now, I argue with Myron, and he's in agreement with me on this because I had to be sensitive about this, because I said, Myron, I think you have more than epilepsy. I think you have elements of schizophrenia. And there's this something called SLPE. It's schizophrenia like psychosis of epilepsy. And this is the borderline between epilepsy and schizophrenia. And schizophrenia is when the doors of perception are blown off. And schizophrenics see the pleroma and of the entities, whatever they are, are coming through and they are part of their hallucinatory life all the time. And it drives them mad. <laughs> Man, it's just mind blowing stuff. And. You know, the first part of everything you said before you got to, to Myron's experiences describes what I experienced to a T, especially the element that you're transported to a foreign environment, for lack of better terms, and you instantly know that it's a familiar place that is more real than your everyday reality. And you can't explain to a skeptic or to a non-experiencer what that feels like. I mean, it's like saying... It hurt when you stabbed me with the pen. Well, how do you know it hurt? Because I felt pain. I know it hurt. I just know it did. Yeah. And that's how the feeling is. You just, you know, it's strange, but yet incredibly familiar. And <laughs> if I hadn't experienced it myself, I mean, that morning I woke up an atheist. I went to bed not knowing what the hell was going on, but <laughs> amazing stuff, man. <laughs> we got through about half the questions I had for you. We'll have to do this again uh, sometime. No, absolutely. Anytime, Greg, you want to do it again, I'm more than happy to do it. You're a great interviewer and you know your stuff. Thank you, man. And you do your research. You actually give me the honor of reading the book, <laughs> which is important. Hosts only have a couple of small jobs and that would be one of them. But, you know, the rest of the world makes it easy for me, I guess. So thanks again, man. Oh, I, you know, one thing I did take away from you, I've been a fan of your work since we first got familiar. You were actually the guest on my 21st show ever. So I appreciate coming on at such an early stage and... You talked about the lucid light device and you made me aware of that. And I was lucky enough to experience one when it came through town. So I'm always going to owe you that because that was. Okay. Okay. Do you, have you got time to tell us about your experience with it? I mean, yeah. Uh, to, to be honest with you, it was a little because they had a dial on the machine and it had 10 stages. And they said, we can dial up the intensity as much as you might like. And on 10, they had the label DMT. And I said, well. You know, I've done DMT. I've, I've, sm I've done several hallucinogens. Let's just go for it. I'm here. I'm not going to see this again. And it, it was interesting, but it's, it felt like, you know, having experienced DMT, it kind of felt like a synthetic version. And I was left kind of dizzy, um, which is not what I experienced with the drug itself. But definitely fascinating that you could get someone that close to a real psychedelic experience with just flashing lights. Um, we are just a, a series of electrodes and we're big computers and it was intense. It definitely was, but I felt like it was still felt slightly simulated and I didn't really get out of body in the way that I've heard other people describe. No, I totally agree with you on that. I, I think the thing is, as you know, I point, I, there's a section in the book where I discuss cliverform constants and cliverform constants, I think, are what it generates. And these are hallucinogenic images, but they are not as powerful as what DMT would be. Mm -hmm. In other words, DMT, I think, is, is kind of looking at a TV screen and seeing something at a distance, whereas DMT gives you, I mean, I've never taken the substance, but I am told, and I would use the analogy, it's like being in an IMAX cinema surround sound 3d the whole caboodle and that's the difference because i do not think you can simulate these things in that way i think they have to be simulated differently and there could be an argument that it might actually stimulate the pineal gland to release dimethyltryptamine endogenous dimethyltryptamine but i remain to be convinced but until i have done dmt i obviously can never really comment 
in that way because I can't, you can. And I think your opinion on that is very, very important. So thanks for sharing that. Hey, thank you, man. I, I wouldn't have even given it a second thought had you not emphasized how useful it could be as a tool. And I'm glad I can knock that off the bucket list for sure. So man... I definitely love this. We could do it all day, but that pretty much is all the time we have. It's been a serious blast talking to you again. Before we go, remind the people where they can get the book and where they can follow more of your ongoing work, maybe on your website. Okay, yeah, my website is anthonypeak.com. It's recently been totally revised, so it's a completely brand new website there, and you'll find tons of material on there. All my interviews, this interview will be up there. My previous interviews with Greg will be up there and everything else. So it will all be there. In terms of my books, you can get them on Amazon. You can order them from your local bookshop. You'll probably find some of them in your local bookshop. They're on Kindle. I'm about to spend.